Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's RETSyndrome.org RET Ed webcast. I am going to try to share my screen here. Let's see. Are you all seeing my slides? I do. I do. Great. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, we have a big topic to cover and we have a lot of attendees who have submitted a lot of questions. Thank you for submitting your questions in advance. Before we get started, I wanted to give you uh, just a few logistics about how GoToWebinar operates if this is your first time joining us. So the audio is open to our presenters only, so you don't have to worry about your background noise. Uh, if you look to the upper right corner of your screen, you'll see a control panel window, and we invite you to type questions or comments um, into the question field throughout the presentation, and we will answer these uh, at the end of the slide presentation, as well as any questions that you pre-submitted uh, at the time of your registration. If we don't get to your questions today, we will work with Dr. Simons and Dr. Banky and team to get all writing questions answered and post a QA document to our Red Ed webpage um, once completed. So if the control panel is distracting to you, you can minimize or move the window, then you may expand it at any time if you wish to submit a question. Next point, the session is being recorded and we will post a link to the recording along with the QA document to the Red Ed webpage so you can listen to it again or share it with others who were not able to join us today. If you're having any trouble hearing, please check and turn up the volume on your phone or device. Um, and let us know in the question field if you don't have your technical issues resolved and we'll try to help you out. So if you joined us today to hear about Rhett Ed, What Hurts, Understanding Pain, and Rhett Syndrome with Dr. Frank Simons from the University of Minnesota, you've um, arrived at the right place. Uh, as I said, this is Paige Nuez. I'm Director of Family Empowerment at RedSyndrome.org. And our Board of Directors, our staff, our entire team want to thank you for being with us today, um, for your support, your engagement. Continuous awareness and empowerment is even more important during these uncertain times. And I say this as both a parent to a beautiful teenager with Rhett Syndrome and as your advocate at RedSyndrome.org. We want you to be as educated and empowered as you can possibly be to care for your child and as you speak to others about Rhett Syndrome. So you can count on RhettSyndrome.org to bring you the latest news and information and to continuously push for new and innovative findings. Um, some of the newest information that we have to share with you is our new RhettSyndrome.org Rhett Research Ready Tool. We hope you visit our website, take a look at it, um, and learn that this is a tool that is um, there to help you understand and evaluate and find the most meaningful clinical trials and research studies that are available for you to participate in right now. Um, especially as we're facing back to school, I also want to remind you that the Rett Syndrome Communication Guidelines, a, a multi-year funded research project, has been published and is available now for order on our website. This is a great guide um, to purchase and get into the hands of your educators and care teams. I also want to give a quick reminder that we have um, continuous Red Eds every single month. The next three that are coming up will be September 8th, Red Ed Holiday Life Hacks for Red Syndrome. In October, we're going to give a clinical trials update. And in November, we're going to do a deeper dive on our communication guidelines. All of these are open for registration right now on our website. We hope you register and can join us for those. And um, of course, we want to thank our sponsors and um, supporters for helping us make this uh, education programming free. We definitely believe that all information should be available to anyone who wishes to seek it. And we could not have sessions like this possible without the help of Acadia Pharmaceuticals, Greenwich Biosciences, and Neuron Pharmaceuticals. So we thank them for their sponsorship and support. Okay. So um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to share those updates. I also want to let you know that we have a special guest with us today, Dr. Tim Banke, who is going to join and discuss as our medical advisor some of your questions that you submitted specifically about medications. We'll talk about that a little bit more after Dr. Simon's presentation. But I wanted to mention that Dr. Banke also um, published a new update for COVID guidelines and some back to school advice. And you can find that on our website. And thank you, Dr. Banke, for that. So um, as we turn to our presentation today, I'd like to have um, Dr. Simon uh, change over to his slides. Um, and while he brings 
Apologies. Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Simons is with the University of Minnesota, and he agreed many months ago to join us today to talk about his research in understanding pain and Rett syndrome. And, um, and really his, his efforts are around assessing and differentiating pain versus behaviors in Rett syndrome and many other developmental disorders. He's a prolific author, editor, and funded investigator. His experience is well grounded in his time in the field, in schools, and homes, and now he spends a lot of time at the university um, mentoring and developing others and doing his own research and work in this area. Um, as a parent, I know um, with full heart and mind what it's like to, to help your child um, to distinguish what could be pain, what could be behavior, um, how to communicate with confidence to our care providers that uh, what she's experiencing and displaying might be pain, and we have to figure out where it hurts. Dr. Simons has really did, devoted his uh, work to helping us have some assessment scales, have some interventions, and he's gonna share some of that work with you today, but really he's gonna talk about his research. After his presentation, we're going to um, address your questions, but we're also gonna schedule a part two Red Ed webinar uh, later this fall or early winter with a physician who can talk more specifically about medication, pain management, and intervention. So, um, Dr. Simons, I, we, you and I have known each other for a long time, and I know you have some wonderful uh, tales to tell us, um, no pun intended. And in the interest of time, we have so much to talk about today. I really want to turn it over to you and let you introduce yourself and share a little bit of your background and let you get going with your presentation. Thank you, Paige. You, you know, hello, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Paige, and retsinum.org. I'm going to push the start on my little timer. And I, I, I don't know. I think I'm being broadcast. I know my, my slides are up. And um, Paige alluded to my tail. So I have a ponytail. And she wondered if I would tell the story of why I have a ponytail. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say I have a ponytail because of Rhett. And I'm going to leave it at that. And then I'll try to finish my talk in a timely way. And if anybody really wants to know, you can put that as one of your questions of, of geez, Frank, why do you have that ponytail? Meanwhile, uh, for any, you know, any hockey players out there, this is my COVID now playoff beard. I'm, I'm actually quite a mess. Uh, this thing's just been growing since March. Um, because we're not in the office. So there you go. Um, so in the interest of time, let me just jump right in. Whoop. Am I am I up there, Paige? Okay. So what I like to do is just start with acknowledgments so that I don't run out of time. And it's a long list, and it comes from two primary places, Gillette Children's, which is a very large children's rehab specialty healthcare system and hospital here in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, as well as University of Minnesota, which is my academic home. Um, in addition to the Midwest Red Center Foundation, Lisa, and I've started adding Chuck, uh, her, her wonderful spouse, and all the families. And really, I think this is our three-legged stool between the clinic at Gillette, the parent group um, with Midwest Red Center Foundation, and the academic uh, piece of it at the University of Minnesota. And we've had We've had some success in sponsored support from NIH all the way through private foundations. What I want to do is start with some disclosures of what I'm not. I'm not a clinician, which will become painfully evident, no pun intended. I'm not a bench scientist. I dabble in thinking about biomarkers and molecules, but I am not a bona fide bench scientist. So I am an academic. I think of it myself as an accidental academic. It's not one thing led to another, let's say, and, and here's where I find myself. So um, with that, and another way of thinking about Paige's introduction, they've already planned a part two because they have an academic leading this one, which means somebody maybe likes to study the problems. And then the second part will be, you know, let's try to solve the problems. And this problem today is pain. So what I want to do today is I'm going to make some candid statements and observations and follow follow my plan is to have three big chunks. One chunk is is, is is listening edification. What is this thing called pain? Turns out there's an official definition. I thought we might as well start with that. I have a little soapbox part where I'm gonna just provide some context for all of us um, related to some historical perspectives on the issues and problem of pain 
broadly, not specific to RET, but in severe disability, severe developmental disability, and some contemporary issues as I see them. Much of this is my opinion um, built around things like the definition and problems therein. So that's part one. What is this thing called pain? Part two, I thought I would review the program of research we have specific to RET and pain and sensory function in close collaboration with the Midwest, Midwest RET Center Foundation, our, our families and collaborators and our clinical collaborators at Gillette. And then three, uh, problem solving to best I'm able. So Paige forwarded me a couple of weeks ago a, a, a long list of specific questions that many of you had mailed in and I know there's been another round of that. So what I tried to do is what I tried to do is create categories or big themes from my reading of your questions. And then I have a general response. I'm gonna make some comments on many of the questions. And then a general response where I wanna spend my time, and it'll be, I'll, I'll tell everybody, wake up, it's the practical part of the talk um, where there's maybe something useful. And I wanna to bring to everybody's attention, and Paige alluded to this, that there are a number of scales out there that are useful and they can be useful in a variety of ways. And so that's where I wanna to get to and spend my time and literally show you them and walk through what they look like and how you might think about using them um, in a collaborative way with providers um, and also at home and, and in school or ed context. So with that, a quick shout out. Many of you may not know there is an, a global organization organized around the study of pain it's called IASP, the International Association for the Study of Pain. Each year, they have a theme. Last year was the Global Year Against Pain and the Most Vulnerable. And so, maybe no surprise, our group here at, at, um, at Gillette and the U, we have organized with several other investigators and clinicians uh, globally for a new special interest group within IASP. And the special interest groups are important because they they pull in resources and they provide opportunities for education and research and training events um, at, the, at the World Congress and at regional meetings specific to those, to those special interest groups. And so we have worked for a long time, uh, particularly Chantel Barney uh, at Gillette Children, uh, in leading and, and getting created a, a first charter on a pain and intellectual developmental disability special interest group. So I wanted to draw everybody's attention that there is a global community, research and clinical community on pain, IASP, within IASP, the International Association for the Study of Pain, there are special interest groups. There is now a special interest group on pain specific to intellectual and developmental disabilities. So that's a FYI. All right, I mentioned, what is this thing called pain? There is a definition, no surprise, it comes from IASP. And I wanna just make a couple of quick caveats or editorial remarks. Some of the things I'm gonna say, I will try to preface what I'm saying, my opinion. And this definition, for example, this is years and years of evolutionary thinking, literally amongst academics, clinicians, providers, of how to get to something that works as a workable definition. And so it's easy in one sense for someone like me to come in and point out the problems, but I'm doing so in, in, in for a reason. And the reason is, of where it's created problems, at least in practice, as it relates to thinking about pain in a contemporary way for individuals with severe developmental disabilities. Now, so here it is. Here's the formal definition of pain as defined by the International Association for the Study of Pain. An unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Now, not to be facetious, so the way this was thought about for many, many years is, and it's not wrong in practice, is basically pain is what the patient says it is. And I use the word patient in a healthcare context, it's not my context. After many years of living with this definition, and I'm not gonna get my calendar dates right, so I'm not gonna try to roll them out, but at some point, it, it was a good 15, 20 years ago now, um, there was a lot of conversation about where the, where the definition was and wasn't working. And there was an issue about the ability to communicate. And so uh, an, an amendment was made to the definition through a note, quote, the inability to communicate in no way negates the possibility that an individual is experiencing pain and is in need of appropriate pain relieving treatment. Pain is always subjective, okay? So that's 
the definition of pain. Whoa, whoa, literally this just in, there's a new definition of pain from the same governing body this spring, 2020. Here's the definition, an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that's familiar, associated with, and then they added this, or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And they had six clauses, one of which supports, repeats, verbal description is only one of several behaviors to express pain. Inability to communicate does not negate the possibility that a human or a non-human animal experiences pain. Okay, so the next few minutes, I'm just gonna keep unpacking some terms that relates to experience and communication and perception etc so right away some of you might be thinking inability to communicate no no my child communicates it may look different or not conventional through spoken word but she or he's communicating so right away it's like inability to communicate no i think there's communication um and this idea of experience and experience related to expression and whether experience and expression mean the same thing so remember i'm an academic but these things are important because they inform and create a framework for how people think of what's quote unquote admissible as pain or not pain. So, but as I said, not to be facetious, but this is based in part on a conversation in my research group, the research group I'm part of here at the U, we had several weeks ago because there's a lot, there's been over the years, a lot of back and forth of different academic groups and individuals weighing in on problems with the definition. And one takeaway for me, based on our own group's discussion a few weeks ago, was that it works in theory, but maybe less so in practice. So here's a quick summary, now this is my opinion, of potential problems created by some people's interpretation of the IAS pain definition. It's very focused on subjective experience. Even with those caveats, there's, there's, there's it verbal report, the ability to verbalize on your subjective experience is paramount. There's a learning element that's important to be able to verbalize. And those three things collectively have the potential to produce a bias against recognizing or identifying pain in vulnerable persons or populations who for a variety of reasons may have impaired or uh, uh, verbal or uh, communicative abilities. And that's a broad group of individuals if you think about it. Again, this is my, my broad part. So newborns, infants, Developmental disabilities, individuals with cognitive impairment, adult dementia, other severe neurological impairments, where there's going to be bias potentially in whether what is being seen and not being seen, what is being experienced, not being experienced, is open to a lot of interpretation, filtered in part through that definition. So, a little more soapbox, a little bit of science. This is still part one. Historically, so here's a here's a here's a scientific you know, title from a paper many, many years ago, indifference to pain in low-grade mental defectives. So why would I put something up there? It's inflammatory, I know that, but I'm, I'm to make a point. So historically, the conventional wisdom has held that individuals, vulnerable individuals with severe developmental disability are indifferent to pain or insensitive. Those mean slightly different things and I'll come back to them in a moment. But that's the historical context. And it isn't specific to individuals with severe developmental disability, that list I just provided, there is a longstanding, and many of you may know this, early belief or myth in pediatrics, that this is newborns, quote unquote, healthy newborns, that in general, the sense was in the medical and research community, is that newborns, uh, nervous systems, quote unquote, were immature, and so pain was not an issue. I'll gloss over a lot of details, both scientific and political, related to uh, the way that um, invasive procedures were conducted. For example, you know, the most common might be a, a heart valve correction. Often, up until very recent times, I'm talking within a generation ago, and so up through the, the 70s and 80s, um, major invasive procedures with newborns would were often conducted with no analgesia, often no anesthetic, usually a paralytic. So why would someone do that, right? The bias, the bias has always been, it seems, when there's vulnerability, that pain isn't on board for all sorts of reasons, scientific at the time, socio-political, for all sorts of reasons, though the bias always has tended to seem to go against the, the vulnerable individual, as opposed to assuming 
Well, we don't know. Let's assume there is possibility for pain or suffering. The biases almost always seem to work the other way. And again, without getting into details, it took some science and some politics. And I, I, I list the key paper in 1987 by Anand and Hickey that basically made the argument that if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's probably a duck, that the human neonate is able to mount biobehavioral responses that sure look like pain, maybe we should treat it like that. So that's, that's in quote unquote, typically developing healthy newborns or healthy newborns with specific fixes that needed to be done. So what about other vulnerable groups? And again, I've listed that, 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 that's a, that, that at the population level is not a small number of individuals. I'm almost done the soapbox. So this is a couple of take home points. Our observations and interpretations of how people with disabilities experience pain and suffering, if you, if one reading kind of the literature over a long arc of 50, 60, 70 years, have been both exaggerated and mythologized in the distant and recent past. At times it has been suggested that people with disabilities are incapable of experiencing pain or incapable of suffering. That's that they're indifferent or they're insensitive. At other times, it has been suggested they experience pain and suffering that is so extreme, constant, and unimaginable that death is the only humane alternative. Now, there was a very famous case. I'm a Canadian. There's a very famous case in Canada in 1993 with a farmer in Saskatchewan who, with a daughter with severe disabilities, who, um, who killed her in relation to a, a sense of empathy and suffering. Uh, in the in the claims that her, his daughter was in constant and uncontrollable pain, and I mentioned I bring this slide up, and I thought long and hard about showing this slide, and I decided to include it. I I, I always include it when I'm in front of providers and trainees to emphasize the point that this is serious business about judgments about pain. Now I know that you know this, and so but I included it to make the point that this is complex and that the suffering and pain that you worry about is not something you're imagining and that we we need to work together to move forward on including our vulnerable most vulnerable among us and our family members so the difficult decisions that any one person find themselves in if they lost hope or or feeling helpless we can work through that and so for me as an academic and as a scientist i want to think about what science can do so here's a quick science not, not a soapbox summary. I think we've had some progress, and this is the chunk I'm gonna spend my time on, on what I call building a better mousetrap. So in the time I've been involved, that 1993 Latimer case in Canada, in part, sparked a movement, I would say, I'll call it that, from a distance amongst a number of research groups, clinical research groups in Canada, um, on, on very explicit pain research in vulnerable populations, whether it was newborns or individuals with disabilities, um, coast to coast in Canada. And out of that, a number of assessment scales have emerged in, 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 that were developed quasi-independently of one another, some in Canada, some in the States, some in the UK, et cetera. And the way I've characterized it after about a decade, a little more than a decade now, a good 15 years, is so we've built, people have tried to build a better mousetrap, meaning can we measure pain? Can we quote unquote catch pain? So that's progress. There, there are scales out there that weren't out there before. Um, consciousness raising, we've made progress. The need for this issue of bias and beliefs and making people aware, whether you're a parent or a provider, that we all have biases and beliefs and around a complex concept or construct like pain, it's important to recognize and acknowledge because it's gonna influence a judgment about somebody else's internal state and their subjective experience. So some of the problems still from a science perspective for me is this natural question, if I think we've built better mousetraps, are we catching more mice? So in severe disabilities, is pain being any better treated now than it ever was just because these scales exist? So that's a knowledge transfer implementation issue, KT. Uh, other problems, news from the bench. So the basic sciences aren't sitting still, obviously. There's a lot of work, a lot of work on what pain is with respect to biology and nociception, which is not a synonym, it's not the same as pain, but sometimes they're used interchangeably. A nociception is the neural encoding of noxious stimuli. Noxious stimuli is something by definition that damages tissue, so i.e. it's painful. 
So what we do know from the bench is that not all pain is the same. There are different molecular mechanisms for inflammatory pain, things called neuropathic pain, or if you make a distinction between acute pain, like I stub my toe, to chronic pain, I'm living with a bad back. Those, those turns out to be regulated by different mechanisms. And if we could figure out those mechanisms in the, in, the, in the children and adults we're interested in with severe disabilities in general, or RETS in particular, maybe we could have more targeted therapies and treatments. So there's a knowledge transfer problem from the bench. How do we move that into, into work in human in general and clinical, but into severe disability? And then some of the promises, and I, I mentioned at the outset, I dabble, biomarkers. Um, the, the attractive part about biomarkers is, well, maybe we get to see, maybe we get an indicator of pain. I think sometimes if I cut out, it's because I have some software thing pop up. I don't know, but I just keep shutting it off. Um, the, 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 the slippery, the, the, what's attractive about biomarkers is this idea of, oh, uh, quote, unquote, can't tell me if, if he or she is in pain, but maybe I could find a dipstick in saliva or blood or some other biochemical, biological source that helps me say, well, there's pain. Um, but I put a quote from the feds. A biomarker is not an assessment of how an individual feels, functions, or survives. So biomarker for pain, tricky. Biomarker for nociception, what the nervous system's doing and its function is maybe, maybe closer to home. Last, what I think of a personal opinion, urgent, largely unattended to, scientifically unattended to, clinical care issues. There's a long list. Advanced post-operative pain management. What's the decision-making framework for that in the context or presence of severe disability? Decision-making about pain management options. Pain assessment and cognition and communication. Non-farm approaches. Procedural pain, particularly for all the repeated procedures that your children experience and have experienced and will experience. All of this list are decisions that have to be made day in, day out, week in, week out by families and providers where there's very little guidance from science. And so, you know, part of our uh, commitment is to try to figure out how to start taking apart some of these things to, to help inform making decisions. And under, underlying this then are recurring conceptual issues. I've mentioned the definition of pain itself. There's sort of another you know, shorthand, you can't ma manage what you can't measure. And so if you don't think you can measure pain, you don't ask about it. Expression does not equal experience. So again, a lot of stuff has been tied to if you see something, and it's, that's equated with whether someone's experienced something, but you already know this, that, that those two don't necessarily go together. If you have severe motor impairment, ataxia, where motor production is impaired or looks differently, how that maps onto experience is not necessarily going to be one-to-one. -one. So I call it a problem of access, access to that experience. Pain does not equal nociception. I've mentioned that. Those are just, pain's a big construct with complicated features that are psychosocial, psychobiological, biopsychosocial. Nociception is a very specific term in relation to the neural encoding of noxious stimuli, tissue damaging stimuli. And that's the dominant model for my next point of what gets studied in labs with, with non-human uh, preclinical models, whether it's mice, rats, or monkeys, is mostly we're studying nociception. We talk about it as if we're studying pain. And pain in a dish is arguably not necessarily the same thing as pain in an intact 21-year-old human who's lived 21 years with a, with this severe disability, five surgeries, and has a G tube, right? That's and your judgment, a provider's judgment of whether or not they're experiencing pain is a complicated thing. So, what are we doing in rent uh, with this young lady? There's two arrows. We are trying to figure things out. That one arrow is pointing to a little um, uh, stimulus device where we're we're poking the foot and we're measuring things like heart rate and trying to figure out if we can just pick up signals uh, and detection of how uh, the body is responding to calibrated tactile stimuli. But that's just my prompt. Many of you will know these faces, Dr. Zogby and Dr. Percy, two giants. And I put this in particularly, you know, we've got, we've got so far ahead on the genes and the mechanism and the molecule and the protein and the mice and then Dr. Percy has led, as almost all of you will know, the natural history study. 
that for our group in Minnesota, we realized sort of what's in between. And, you know, I'm embedded in part in a special education program, part of a department of educational psychology. We have questions about what to do about behavior and communication and health concerns right now. And, you know, this there's nothing quantitative about this other than to say there's very little of the research that gets done in RET, there's very little work specifically in that applied behavioral realm, uh, right or wrong. It's not a right or wrong statement. It's just there's more work to be done and there's limited amount. And that's sort of our zone of where we live between the 30,000 foot snapshot of the, from the natural history study and between the bench. A couple more things just to clarify where we're coming from. Ten years ago now, IRSF at that time, retsonum.org now, released a white paper, and in it they prioritized clinical research prior, uh, uh, areas, one of which was to identify and validate novel clinical trial outcome measures. So that's kind of something in our head of what is it we're doing? Are we thinking, if not primary, maybe secondary outcome measures as trials have come online, that they should be functionally relevant to RET, and that they and, and as practical considerations, outcome measures need to accommodate communication and motor skill limitations. So, you know, investigating quantitative physiological measures, imaging, et cetera. And some of you may know some of our work, we dabble, like I said, in biomarkers. We're very investigated, in, invested in investigating saliva. We've done a lot of work with thermal imaging, uh, et cetera. All of this is trying to line up around pain and sensory function in part. So. You know the diagnostic criteria, I've just highlighted in yellow and at the bottom, that supportive criteria, diminished response to pain is something that's been out there for a long time. And for me personally, but also professionally, quite interested in that. So our program of work research in pain in RET is just acknowledging that we, in our, in our opinion, pain is not well understood or documented in RET. Uh, and certainly there are, there are individual groups, Jenny Downs and, and others on the East Coast that are chipping away at this problem too. We're not the only ones trying to understand pain and sensory function. Um, I'm just representing what, what we've been doing. There's, you know, it's clear there, there are numerous chronic health problems, all of which that it would be reasonable to suspect that at some point are going to be the causal or ride along with or be an outcome of pain. Um, and then there is, a, there is a sense amongst both parents and providers that there's altered pain Right, I mean that's part of the diagnostic criteria, the, the uh, uh, supporting criteria for atypical. Um, this apparent pain insensitivity or indifference, and I've mentioned those two terms before. That if someone appears indifferent, or they don't feel it, don't perceive it. So this is what we're trying to untangle. And one more thing to frame it, and then I'm going to show you some titles of what we've done and tell you about one study, and then try to move into the useful part around the scales. So. Those three ellipses, uh, pain sensation, pain experience, pain behavior. So there's, let's take that definition and break things down. There's three different categories right there. Pain sensing, pain experience, pain behavior. Nociception, perception, and expression. So we have stuff we've tried to get at expression. That's pain behavior. Those are the scales and, uh, and things like it. Where can we measure behavior that we think is maybe a signal or sign or symptom of pain, sign and symptom. Sign is something quote unquote objective, symptom is subjective, it's self-report. But if self-report in a conventional way through language is absent, then there's really two ways forward. And I'll mention this again, but you're either gonna go up a sign-like approach, meaning objective measurement of somebody's behavior, or a symptom by proxy re approach where somebody's reporting on what they think is somebody's internal state or experience. So, hence biomarkers. I mentioned this. Bio, so, but biomarkers, no, it's not like that arrow is connected to behavior experience. It's pain sensation. It's no susception. So, biomarkers around neuronal activity broadly in the pain pathways and the biology of the, of the person. And pain experience, perception. And then look at that box on the right. Things that come right out of psychology, right? Expectation, fear, experience, emotion, attention, belief, need. Those are factors that influence. For all of us, if we self-report on a scale of zero to 10 of how much pain we're in around a certain experience. So the, it's double jeopardy and that job gets harder as a proxy reporter of your son or daughter's experience 
your own expectations and fears probably influence the way you're thinking about what they're experiencing as well well you same with the hospital the providers or the teacher or the para or the rehab specialist so that's why pain as a construct is complicated complex and different from thinking quote unquote just about nociception and what the biology is doing it's not that that's not irrelevant but it's one part of a more complicated story so here's how i think about it that in ret and pain our goal is to improve comfort reduce pain i've characterized this already getting at that it's by definition subjective how do you get access to a subjective experience when someone can't use language in a conventional way and this is some of your questions what does pain look like in ret what are the pain mechanisms in ret so i'm just going to put out how we've approached this mention some studies and then move into that assessment piece but here's you know so here's how we try to build around that you think about symptoms and those are the nonverbal rating scales of which i'm going to list out many in just a moment so we're going at this in a multifactorial way so pain signs we've in part used an examination procedure that's standardized just looks like a passive range of motion and then a scale got developed to code from that and i'll talk a little bit about that again later during assessment so pain symptoms now nonverbal rating scales so somebody else is reporting the source of information there is let's say from a parent or provider then the pain signs is examining the individual themselves but and scoring behavior measuring behavior sensory features there's a big world of what's called quantitative sensory testing where usually in neurology they may test its reflex like but calibrated to look at the way somebody perceives hot cold light touch pinprick deep pressure and there's a way to assess that we've we've uh, we've modified that approach and started a set of studies in severe disabilities in general and rent in particular to think about how somebody how, how what does it look like very specific to cold or warm or pinprick and we code we videotape and code behavior where we're trying to isolate different channels related to sensory function biomarkers um, there's work done post-mortem on nerve growth factor uh, through cerebral spinal fluid people have looked at substance p so we're interested as i mentioned in saliva uh, saliva blood csf are some of the big three for sources and then autonomic indicators and i mentioned earlier infrared thermal imaging so using infrared thermal to quantify something you all know the cold hands and cold feet so that's our array of trying to deal with this problem of access all of this is in lieu of just asking does that hurt how are you doing today so pain symptoms pain signs sensory features biomarkers autonomic to figure out if we can be informed by other research programs that have either bench or clinical research that are mechanism oriented that we can pull into RET to get to work back from pain mechanisms, to what does pain look like, to improving comfort and reducing pain. So the strategy from a research perspective is to look for relationships among these. Do they go together? Should they go together? What does that tell us? So we might look, I mean, might jump around between behavior and biology, et cetera, et cetera. So what this has led to is a number of papers, I'm not going to get into the details, but of starting at the beginning when we start, first got involved. That involved goes back to my ponytail story. So asking parents to tell us what they take as examples of pain or pain behavior in their, in their child. Uh, learning from parents and families of things that uh, are associated with worry or stress. Um, and seizures, as you all know, are, are, are almost always at the top, particularly when they're uncontrolled, but also pain uncertainty and knowing whether or not your son or daughter is in pain. That led to some work that's ongoing of, well, can we develop and compare subjective and objective measurement approaches looking at pain experience, that's the sensory side for us, and expression, the measured output, the behavior. And our slide into biomarkers. I mentioned infrared thermal analysis. We've been looking at heart rate. Um, in relation to when we're poking the skin, do those go together? Um, uh, in, invasively, we've collected skin samples to look at the nerves that are the front end 
part of the relay from skin to spinal cord to brain of what does that look like in red. Uh, and then we've looked at it in the context of care and post-operative treatment. So I'm just going to expand on this just very quickly. Um, this was work going in chart review at Gillette, comparing um, a sample of girls age matched, obviously gender matched, on the same procedure, spinal fusion surgery for scoliosis, with girls um, without developmental disability, uh, so what would be called idiopathic um, scoliosis, and then girls with cerebral palsy. So all, all three sets of patients, that, those groups, same procedure, um, and we wanted to look postoperatively how pain was managed. Now two things, on, at least on my screen's left, the lower uh, data path is RET, and I've put a red dot around, postoperative day. Right out of the gate on, on post-op day, just that day, the amount of, on the left is, is analgesic management, pain management. And what we noted was that the sample, the girls with, that were idiopathic, so typically developing, quote unquote, or girls with cerebral palsy, same procedure, were being medicated analgesically the same way. Uh, the sample, the girls with RET were not, they were receiving less. And that persisted over the course of several days. Now, on the right-hand side, you might say, yeah, but they need less, right? There's that sense they're indifferent and sensitive. I don't know if that's true or not. So on the right, those are pain scores, completed bedside by nursing staff. Now, right out of the gate, the pain, the nursing, the, the pain rating for the girls with RET was lower. But then you can see it jump up, and for the most part, it's indistinguishable. Those, there's no statistically meaningful difference there as we went on of the ratings, the daily bedside ratings of pain across the three groups. But we already know that they were being managed differently analgesically. And so for us, this isn't a critique of, of this system's post-operative care. It raises though a set of issues about, well, is it true or is it not true that they needed less analgesia? Because the ratings, other than the the day of surgery looked pretty similar. So there's a sense that what's being rated as pain is present, but the way it's being managed seems different. And we, I want, we want to take that apart because what we want to get to are some guidelines, practice guidelines of, of how do you help uh, in care facilities like this that are providing uh, needed interventions and supports, um, what the right thing to do is. And that's, that's in part the way that I think that science can be useful and helpful. Okay, I'm mindful of my time. So if you've drifted off or you've, you know, you're, you're folding laundry, I'm now shifting to the practical problem solving. I'm gonna walk through a bunch of assessment scales. Now, here's the questions, categories, themes I derived from the first wave of questions that Paige sent me. Again, there are lots, I mean, there are hundreds. And so, but a one category is, does my child feel pain? What does it look like? What do I do about it? How does it relate to other issues like irritability, mood, and self-injury? What about specific types or sources of pain? GI, dystonia. There were also questions that came in in a second wave about drug-drug interaction. So if you're... Front line or second, a, a second line of anticonvulsants. Do those interact and in what ways with, with pain uh, analgesic, pain management medicines, etc. So, so here's what I'm going to try to do. Here's my response, assessment. But I, and I don't mean it just a here's a scale. Good luck. The, what's happening are two things. So I mentioned there's been there's 15 years of development of the better mousetrap, meaning scales design for use or repurposing scales, measurement scales, for individuals with severe communicative impairments or nonverbal or no language, et cetera. Now, one evolutionary step, my language for it is, there, there is this move to toolboxes where a single scale for, designed for a single purpose isn't gonna be sufficient. Remember my thing of all the different ways we're trying to get at pain and pain's complex, that there's a toolbox mentality of get different features of pain assessment measurement tools in your toolbox. So I just that's the mindset to organize and think about specific scales. 
And what I want to say with, well, what are you supposed to do with them? It's not just assess when you think pain. I'm trying to think of a slightly longer view that's in relation to an ongoing relationship in a coalition way that you, I know you almost all will already have with your child's health care and education team of, of, of using these tools as a way to establish baselines, to think about when times are good and when times are not so good so that more information is available in an agreed upon way across hospital, home, clinic, education, community of of for your son or daughter of so that everybody's kind of on the quote unquote same page of this thing called pain. That's how I think maybe these assessment tools can be most useful as opposed to diagnostically. Is that pain then treat it this way? That's I'm gonna fess up right now. Those those aren't tightly linked. So it's in my mind someone asked a question about, you know, is this is facial dystonia painful? What to do about it? Well, it probably is. Uh, what do they do with in other patients with dystonia without RET, right? And if we assess it, does there something specific as opposed to dystonia in in the in 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 the legs or or extremities different? We, we simply don't know if there's those different sources even for the same condition produce different kinds of pain. So back to my baseline logic for your son or daughter to get a sense more than a snapshot, repeated you know picture of what this looks like in, with the goal of keeping the, of creating new opportunities to communicate with providers that need to make decisions for optimizing, reducing pain and improving comfort. So I'm gonna skip a couple slides, uh, just in interest of time. Of, I've, I've alluded to self-report is the gold standard that comes in part because it's a personal experience. Subjective does not mean real, but we've talked about this, that there are many, groups, vulnerable groups for whom self-report is going to look differently. And so the issue again is access. So pain assessment tools and Chantel Barney at Gillette, who is a clinical research scientist there and their knowledge translation, one of their knowledge translation leads, pulled, helped pull these together um, uh, late last week. So I'm indebted to her. And, and they, 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 there's two flavors to each slide. Um, the left side on, on my screen is, if you will, a scientific summary of, of the, the scale, and the right side shows it. I actually want to focus on the right. So this is this is what's and so you you could be thinking, well, how do I get these? So um, I've got a website listed coming up to Lure View, which is a, a large rehab hospital associated with Toronto Sick Kids. Um, in Toronto and also you can email me and I will put you in touch with Chantel Barney at Gillette Children's that has taken this Bloor View toolkit box and got it a little more focused for their Gillette um, uh, patient population and again it has elements of some of these scales so I'll give you links to it or you can go through page to get to me or you can just come to me directly and I'll get you links to toolboxes or these individual scales Okay, so pain, uh, pediatric pain profile. Uh, this is an, this is this is the one that I, I like to roll out from the idea of you're trying to build documentary evidence in a baseline like way of your child's and the idiosyncrasies of what who makes what makes them who they are as it relates to pain and comfort. So you have an opportunity to list out early and past pain experiences, an infant, any prior surgeries, illness, and injury. On a good day, on a good day, my child is cheerful, sociable, appears withdrawn, you know, and you rate that. And you might do this, you know, at the end of each day over a week or with your significant other, talk about times that we think was a good day. What's their profile look like as it relates to things that may change if they're in pain or discomfort? So then most troublesome pain. So on a good day versus most troublesome pain, the thing that you think is causing the most problems, whether that's GI or dystonia I mentioned, or whatever it may be that you're not absolutely certain about, that's okay. But you have your suspicion of index, so go with it and then list out on these behavioral indicators, when my child is in pain, that we think is in pain, 
he or she, what do they look like? What are they doing? What are they not doing? So that's what that is, pain A. And there's there's multiple leaflets in this in this in this package, this pediatric pain profile, that there can be more than one pain, right? And then there are ongoing assessments. So this is more time in in a clinic like or in a in a school or at home of tying it around maybe an activity, like it could be related to therapy, stretching, et cetera. You know, is this procedure or during feeding, we think there's there's GI stuff, so before, during, or after feeding. So there's an opportunity to make it more dynamic around activities or events that are happening. And then there's a way to summarize that. And so, look, I've been around the RET parent community. I know you guys are data-driven. And, and so you're, you're all scientists-like in your thinking. So there's a way to chart and graph that. Now, you're not going to do this in a way that, a scientist is going to come along and say that's not right. That's that you should have done. You should have done that. That's not the point. The point is you're trying to get a snapshot that's more than a single that relates to different elements of day-to-day -day life, on good days, bad days, around events or procedures, so you can get a bigger profile, a better, a more complete profile, form part of the conversation with providers or educators or rehab specialists about what they see. So the goal can be convergence on you're all calling what that is the same thing and then thinking about, well, let's go after it as opposed to not being on the same page. So I know I'm repeating myself on that, but that's the goal for me. So again, I think this was a summary of recommendations, but pediatric pain profile is one scale that's got multiple pieces that's designed to think about a profile, just that, good days, bad days around procedures. There's a single scale called the Non-Communicating Children's Pain Checklist Revised, NCCPCR. What I think it's, it's helpful for a lot of things, the way I think about it more and more is it's a good tool to use with families or a provider with family or vice versa to say, these are the things that we take as signs that our son or daughter um, is in pain or discomfort. And it, there's the big broad categories, vocal, social, facial, activity body limbs and a way to rate them that's and usually it's tied in a time limit last two hours you can you can work on that there's also a post-operative version of this so again non-communicating children's pain checklist it's a way to think of cataloging these are the kinds of behaviors we think that we use as indicators of pain or discomfort now switching a little bit to let's say functional outcomes or what's pain's impact We've uh, uh, taken, we've, we've, we've been investigating and used for quite some time now what's called a modified brief pain inventory. And what this is, is about interference. Is pain or discomfort interfering with activities of daily living? And rating it on a zero to 10 of does not interfere, it completely interferes. And again, you could imagine having this as a way to communicate it, particularly across home or rehab or, or school and rehab contexts of trying to understand over a longer period of time how your son or daughter is doing with respect to let's say there's been surgery or seizures are being treated a different way. You can be monitoring the pain piece of that and its interference in activities of daily living. Now I'm glancing at my little dumb phone timer and I know I'm a tad over 45 minutes. So I'm gonna wrap this up in a moment. So I've mentioned the pediatric pain profile the non-communicating children's pain checklist revised, the brief pain inventory. Um, there's a scale called FLAC or now revised FLAC. Now this was very much, this was developed in a nursing context, bedside clinical. And it's going, and so think, and new, neonates, infants, uh, very young children. So they were going in a very dynamic context state of going off big categories of face, legs, activity, cry, consolability in the context of something being done like a needle stick I'm trying to understand um, if that infant uh, was in pain or not in relation to behavioral indicators. So it's been modified in part to use for children with severe cognitive impairments. I wanted to draw your attention to it. Um, I mentioned this earlier, we, our group a long time ago working in the context of very severe disability in adult was taking the approach of pairing a rating scale with a, a passive range of motion exam, we call the pain examination procedure, and then scoring it. We've been using it very much as a research tool, 
And so its clinical utility is not strong because we spend hours trying to code based on videotape. But its origins in part were, hey, you know, could it be done in the context of, of we were working in the context of group homes, et cetera, where there's a standard examination, it's videoed and scored quickly on those standard areas of almost like flack of changes in face, arms, et cetera, et cetera. So that exists. Um, and it was done in the context, again, of procedures where the, we score the, the rating scale at a baseline period, then exam, and then baseline and exam. In this case, this, you know, an undetected fracture was, was found. We also, and we use this as our research tool to get a broad sense of what parents see and think about with regard to pain type, source, intensity, duration, frequency, chronicity, how long does it last, and different things that people have tried. And we've bundled this in, in a tool we call the Dalhousie Pain Interview. So you'll see there's some common flavors, so I'm not gonna go through each item, but where we're trying to get a sense of, of how much, how often, how long does it last, where do you think it is, et cetera, et cetera, to try to think about source. What have you done about it? What was the most troublesome rank order, et cetera, et cetera. Now, last things, the, the toolkits. So I mentioned Holland Beer Review. I'm going to end in a moment with the website, plus I can get you that link. Page can, I can, I can get you to Chantel. And in it, they have a variety of tools in the toolkit. The body diagram, where do you think the pain is? That non-communicating children's pain checklist. A pediatric version of that interference scale. The pediatric pain profile, et cetera, et cetera. So there's pain stuff, there's pain coping both for families and the individual. Um, there is also what I mentioned, the Gillette toolbox. And so they've gotten it down to a, 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 a smaller number of items where they have a pain inventory in general that includes a pain questionnaire that's trying to get a sense in the last week, you know, how of pain, what's been the most intense, what's been the, you know, mo the least, what would you say the average, what's the pain like right now in your son or daughter? There's that brief pain inventory. Again, we're very interested in interference, interference in activity of daily living, pain profile. So we've lifted elements out of that pediatric pain profile to talk about on a good day, what pain looks like on a bad day. There's prompts related to talking about pain. Now, in a, in, with an individual, your son or your daughter, uh, where the, if, if, if language is impaired, then that's going to rely on a parent parent or grandparent and aunt and uncle to talk about whether pain has been lasting and has duration and might be chronic longer than three months um, you know especially in a post-operative context we're going to want to know so these are kits and these kits are the tools to try to start measure monitoring and measuring to be able to communicate so that's the link i'll just leave that up for a moment um, i can send it to you i also had a youtube link it's out of Gillette talking about their approach to this toolbox development and comprehensive care for complex uh, medical management cases in pain and comfort. Um, and that is, that's me rounding out because my last slide is my end slide that says that's all folks. And again, you can just, in this day and age, you know, just type in Holland Blur View pain toolbox. You'll get to that toolbox. And I can get you to Chantel to get to the Gillette context. So there, that's it. I'm five minutes over. I apologize. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Simons. That was an incredible presentation. You unpacked a lot of information. Uh, we do have, I'm gonna bring my webcam back up. Um, we do have some questions for you. But first I'd like to know if Dr. Benke, um, our guest, physician and ret expert, retologist from uh, Denver, would like to share some thoughts on this presentation before we get to questions. So I'm going to, yeah, that was great, Frank. Thanks very much for that. Uh, I'm going to put on my, my parent hat and say, how many of these tools do you think can be translated to a clinical environment where uh, I'm a parent, I'm calling you, you're my clinician and saying, my daughter hurts. 
I mean, how, how do we utilize these sorts of tools as we go from there in your mind? Well, that's exactly, I mean, maybe part two also pull in Chantel. That is what the effort is at Gillette with the knowledge translation implementation priority of how can you take stuff that uh, the eggheads have developed, the academics, and I, I, that's, I'm directing that at me. Many of my colleagues that developed this are, are clinical researchers in the clinic. But can you take it and get it into use? And my understanding of listening to Chantel, she presented, she has data on implementation, the modifications that had to be made to get to that toolbox. So that's why I was sort of saying the Holland Blur View is a long list of scales. The, 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 the Gillette one for me is a little bit different flavor of it's been designed to be inserted into the Gillette side of practice so that they are able in the in the variety of clinical contact ways, whether it's an acute care or chronic care or post-operative or pre-operative visit, whatever the nature of the visit, to get those tools so that a provider, whether it's a nurse, rehab specialist or a physician, can and will use them. And my understanding from Chantel is the data is that over time their uptake, the implementation, their adaption is 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 pretty good. Now, it still is open, you know, kind of my mousetrap metaphor. So that so if they're using them, well, how is that data being used in terms of what treatment decisions are they making that's different if they didn't? And I can't answer that one. But I, I so let me let me answer it even just more concretely. The stuff that's sitting in that Gillette toolbox that's an amalgamation of some of, if you will, the best features maybe of all those individual scales I, I showed, my understanding is that those are being actively used on the clinician side uh, at Gillette with, with, with you know little resentment or begrudging of this takes too much time, it's not useful. They've gone through that process to get it to being that a provider will support its use. Now, I'm not advocating for any one parent, you go in shaking something like that at your own physician and saying, how come you're not using this? It, it, you, you gotta you know, work on take the relationship you have and ease these things in. But there's certainly, Gillette could be pointed to as, as a context in which it is, these things are being used in the context of clinical care and severe disability. Okay, well, Dr. Simon, what I really appreciate is, and our goal today was really to lay out this concept of pain, right? And do our kids feel it the same way we do? Um, and how we, we project our experience of pain onto them. And I love how you have discussed how the physician community and the research community um, understands pain. Because as Dr. Benke said, the parent hat on, this is where the rubber hits the road for us. Um, is is uh, we know our children best. We know all of these things. Uh, we know that uh, our, with good instinct that we think how what she's experiencing and expressing is different than baseline. We wish there were a magic wand where we could just walk into the pediatrician or GP's office and say she's hurting. Tell me where she hurts because she can't tell me. Um, what I really appreciate is that you have acknowledged that it is a difficult question to answer and there are a lot of different domains that we as parents need to be respectful of and that we can be a partner with our physicians in helping get to the answer and that these, some of these scales are really the best tool that we have available right now. Um, what I appreciate is your work in changing those early definitions of pain and helping clinicians rethink assessment of pain for our kids that helps them be a better part of that <laughs> well i, I let just because this is being recorded in public in that in that sense i don't think my work changed the definition uh I'm, it's i've been following its change and i i needle some of the people that are the people that touch that world about thinking about the issues that we and, and families face and so i've tried to be a voice that way but I am in no authorship group on, on those formal definitions. I'm a consumer. I 
you are an advocate. So I appreciate your, 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 your humbleness. Um, okay, to lighten things up a little bit, I want to address the questions that are in the queue. The very yep. first one is, gee, Dr. Simon, why the ponytail? Oh, really? Are you making that up? That's the very first one in the queue? Who that is the that? very first one in the queue, yeah. Can I call out who asked that? No. Well, okay, so just very quickly, uh, Paige knows this. So I got a long ponytail, and the reason I have a long ponytail is when I first got involved and introduced to the RET community here in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, uh, Brianne Byers, a, a close colleague who leads very much our program of research at the U and RET, we attended and uh, the, a family parent meeting with Gillette uh, Ed Day and the, the, the couple of docs were given updates on the gene. And this is a while back now. Anywho, what we thought what we'll do as we introduced ourselves, we will survey the local families to find out what's on your mind. We'll use a bunch of rating scales around things around communication, adaptive behavior, blah, 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 blah. And I said at the time, I believe that What's going to happen is we're going to mail you this stuff, and you all say with best intentions, you're going to fill it out, you'll return it to us. But I know you're not going to, because when surveys get sent out, and we have no follow-up mechanism, very few actually get turned back in, and it creates a problem. Now, at that time, I had more hair on top, the beard wasn't as long, and I did not have a ponytail. And I said, I'm going to do a little challenge, that I will not cut my hair until you guys do a 50% response rate or better. That's, that's, I don't know how many years ago. It's over a decade ago. So long story short, that local survey, our first survey in the RET local community, nobody, you know, predicted. I think, you know, I don't know what our response rate was, but we never beat 50% and I never cut my hair and I still haven't cut my hair. And I go to RET Ed Day and meet with the families and tell the story every year. And I, for a while, I coached youth hockey. I was going to try to tie in a fundraiser for the highest donation could pick how much of my ponytail to cut off, donate it to Locks for Love on behalf of the Midwest, Midwest RET Syndrome Foundation um, and make a whole bunch of money for uh, a good cause. But I haven't done that. So every year this thing keeps growing. And then meanwhile, the stuff on top gets thinner and thinner. And basically, bottom line is I don't have an exit strategy. So there's the ponytail came from a lost bet with our local RET family group that I have never cut. Well, thank you. And I, I will remember many of our family conferences where you have come and shared that story as well with our parents and our community. <laughs> And, uh, and I want you to share it because I don't want you to give up that challenge to families that whenever a survey yeah. is launched to our RET community, Dr. Simons is going to grow his hair and never cut it unless you answer the survey. So, well, we could do something with the beard, right? You know, post COVID, I'll keep growing this thing out until we figure out, you know, pain. That's a, that'll, I'll, no, I'll take that back. Never mind. Okay, well, we're, we're going to keep this because this is a, you know, this is a challenge that I that after, at the end of every red day of every meeting of every family that I speak to that if we want to see change happen um, in Rett syndrome, we all need to participate. And uh, you're, you're giving us a very literal level of grading <laughs> our participation. So uh, you keep it up and I will continue to request families to participate in all studies. Well, yeah. and, I, and, and I, I, I appreciate that. I will acknowledge, I know, I know what I know. What I know is this is such a committed group of, of families and we're, we are very grateful for the opportunity to, to be partners. And we do try to be mindful of the kinds of things we ask in that sometimes it seems like you already asked us that stuff. And so whenever it repeats, we're doing that for a reason because measures need to be able to show certain properties statistically. And so one way to find that out is use them repeatedly over some time scale so we can find out how the measures perform. But I understand people like me asking or a group, we need you, we're gonna do the same thing again. We kind of did that already. She didn't like it or he didn't like it. We know. So we're deeply appreciative of the opportunities that have been afforded to us to try to, you know, get the data points to build the breadcrumb trail to what we're trying to do here and keep up. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you take, answering that with all sincerity. So we hope that everyone um, participates with the RET Research Ready program and trust that that's a toolkit that we have built on our website to help you identify what studies are, are uh, worthy of participation. Right now, that tool reflects things that are in clinicaltrials.gov. But we are making modifications so that as Dr. Simons and team and others across the country and around the world are doing research that is not clinical trial specific, we can get those studies into the RET Research Ready program to easily get you participation, more easily. Okay, so now that that's, uh, that's been addressed uh, about the ponytail, let's ask a couple of questions. I think the majority of questions you answered in your big picture uh, bucket. Some of them, I think, bear a little bit of um, uh, revisiting, and then definitely a lot of these we're going to tee up for part two when we talk about um, treatment of pain. So your, your session is really focused on identifying pain. Is she in pain? Is he experiencing pain? Um, and you've really laid out uh, the complexity of how we answer that question. So that's the biggest takeaway that I want people to take today is even the experts have trouble validating if it's pain the way that we experience it. And there are some scales that you can use to help uh, get a team answer. Um, but one question that was answered a few times, or asked a few times in the queue and um, pre-submitted was about seizures in relation to pain. So I wanna ask this of both Dr. Simons and Dr. Banky. A lot of parents feel that seizures are an expression of pain and are usually can be centered around GI um, issues, and they've done some of this tracking. As you said, most of us parents try to be quasi-scientists, and we know that we have to track and graph uh, points in time and repeat events to, to assess chronic pain. So uh, that long explanation to say, what do you think about seizures? Are they a part of an, on an, uh, a nervous system experience? Overall, GI seizures, everything is connected, or is it an indicator of pain at times? Uh, I'm like gonna nod over to the real doctor. To, <laughs> Tim, you go first. So a lot of parents report this, and I think that um, it's important to pay attention to this. Um, we know that there is a lot of connections between uh, how pain is communicated to the brain. Um, it goes through a little relay station called the thalamus. And we know that um, there is actually an anti-seizure thing called the vagal nerve stimulator, which is really stimulating the thalamus and it modulates seizures. So there is at least a connection in that regard where we can understand how the two can possibly be connected. We still don't know exactly how the vagal nerve stimulator works in, in, in lowering seizures, but it's there. But I think that one of the other features of, of pain and discomfort and seizures is, is when, whenever your child is in pain, they have an altered stress response, they don't sleep the same, and we know those things as well lower your seizure thresholds. If your GI system is not working the way that it should be, then it's also possible that you're not absorbing your anti-seizure medicines the way that you should be. So there's a lot of different ways uh, about how this can come about. And I think that, it, you know, as, as we collect with information with things like the Natural History Study um, and our ongoing clinical efforts, th this is something that we hope to understand more. But it is something that a lot of, a lot of parents uh, report and we recognize that. And we, we do our best we can't put a vagal nerve stimulator in everybody, but I think my approach at least is to understand what are those features of pain that I can potentially modify um, in terms of how that might then lead to lowering your seizure thresholds. So, so that's my clinical approach to that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, if anyone has an add-on to that, please uh, type it into the queue now. And uh, Dr. Simon? Well, no, that, that's... I can't say that the same way. The, 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 I would just reinforce that w when you said that question, what I went to is an element of what, what Tim just mentioned of, of, of 
things in our the way we're done biologically regu- you know set points and so i was just thinking about the relation for example between sleep and pain or autonomic function in general and pain and seizures where it could be that you know if, if you're in chronic pain living in a chronic pain state that'll disrupt something like sleep which has a feed forward where you, your body is not getting what it needs that could lower the threshold for seizure or whatever so and it goes the other way around if there's things that disrupt sleep that changes your threshold for pain so that's that that's yeah that and it's it's at the mechanism mechanism level nerves and chemicals and all, we don't know exactly how they're all talking to one another but they're clearly talking to one another and the conversations i've had with our local clinician scientists like tim Feynman, our biasing are so you know would it be like a you know this is separate from trials but for other stuff back to that day-to-day behavior health etc you know what if you went all in on let's really try to regulate sleep you know do you see improvements in reports of pain or discomfort in, in seizure onset or GI function or flip it and go all in on something autonomic uh, and regulate that and or go all in on pain and comfort and you see improvements in sleep so so there's ways to set up little mini micro clinical research trials that are very practical and patient oriented around that sort of complex set of interactions that that those questions are are reflecting And course, I think that in easy to say, hard to do. Uh, would you recommend that parents do some of that uh, strategizing themselves at home? I think a lot of families right now are deciding uh, how best to how best to deal with trying to figure out if it's pain. As we're maybe thinking a little bit more guardedly about going into a clinic, or if a lot of clinic appointments are moving towards telehealth, so we're not getting the opportunities for as many hands-on. Uh, opportunities with our regular therapists, school teachers, um, other professionals who could give us advice? I would say that um, when you're being assessed for pain, it really is challenging. And I've experienced this of with trying to do this via telehealth. I really have to lay my hands on you to move your bones, to push on your belly, to see if we can figure out where the pain is coming from. And I I think the parents know is there's so many places where the pain can come from. Is it her back? Is it her belly? Is it her feet? Is it her knees? Is it her her hips? Does she have a headache? And those were some of the questions that came out. But oftentimes the only way that you could do that or I can do that is I need to take a look at you. And it, it really is a challenge to do that with a telehealth visit. And so I think that if this is what's going on, then you shouldn't avoid an in-person visit. You know, all of our facilities are doing our best to, if you have to go somewhere, then your hospital should be one of the safest places. We've all got, we're all wearing masks and gloves and we're sanitized and we have face shields and we get rapid testing if we have symptoms. And if we have symptoms, we can't even come to the building because we have to fill out surveys every day and our temperature's taken. So in terms of a place where you're going, the hospital is one of your more safest places. Is it risk-free? No, it's not. But I think that if if this is what's going on, then being seen is what needs to happen if your child is is in pain and you can't can't initially figure out what's going on with a telehealth visit, then you might have to come have somebody take a look at you. I, I would uh, just add to that. Of, I, I think this is a parent community that are many scientists, and I don't say that in a facetious way, that they're thinking scientifically. With that said, it, it, at least, you know, to, just to add on to Tim's point, um, if you're not in as regular contact as you have in the past, but you can be through tele or some other mode, and you're thinking about making changes, at least check in and consult as opposed to making decisions of dosing or whatever uh, in an experimental way of I'm going to do less, I'm going to do more because now I'm measuring like Frank said, but uh, but pull your provider in on those that decision-making set of ideas. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I think it's really important. 
especially as I'm hearing more parents report that after months, uh, for a lot of our families, after months of isolation, you know, our kids are maybe expressing loneliness, sadness to the change of circumstances, and we're still stuck saying, is she in pain? Is she having a new symptom? Is there a new medical reason uh, that's going on with her that's not being addressed or for, for she or he, you know, is it more psychological, emotional? Um, so the, this topic, although you agreed to give it months ago, is I think even more relevant today um, to, to say, trust your instinct. If you feel that the behavior is different than baseline, track it to the best of your ability, track all of the variables that you can, use the scales that Dr. Simons has presented, and talk to your providers. Um, it has to start with telehealth, it has to start with telehealth, but if you really feel that she needs to go in, as Dr. Benke said, you know, the clinics are safe, doctors know what they're doing, um, they're probably the least likely to spread um, anything or put you in a position of vulnerability. Um, I have two more questions, and then I think we're going to get to the end of the hour um, pretty quickly here. One of them is adult care versus pediatric care. Dr. Simons, the scales that you shared are really designed for pediatric use. Should our adult population use the same scales, or are there different scales? That's a very good point, a fair question, and, and I meant to acknowledge that some of their their, their, their own, if you will, developmental paths of scale development were in very different contexts. I mentioned that FLAC was hospital, newborn, infant, um, some were child, some were adult. I, I think, I think um, in one general sense, I don't think the nature of the items and there's so much, there's some, a lot of commonality in terms of the big categories and how they're organized um, that it's necessarily pediatric specific. We have taken the pain interference, uh, for example, and adapted and accommodated. We've changed some items that are appropriate for uh, child, adolescent, and, and and so there's a parallel form for adult with, that it relates to community, um, more community stuff than at home stuff. So I think, I think in general, um, the scales will work in the way that I'm thinking about uh, for, for the purposes of monitoring, me, me, starting with a measure to, to monitor, to then use as a way to share information. I think it's okay whether it's child, adolescent, or adult um, in terms of the non-communicating children's pain checklist. And my child's 35. That's okay because you could use it on me. It's a way to inventory the different ways that uh, that he, he or she may be expressing pain or discomfort based on what you observe. So I think it's for the most part, okay. And again, you're not engaged in a clinical research endeavor. So if it's a line, if there's a, if there's an item about that's, that's, that's obviously geared towards um, infants or toddlers, then ignore it don't use it, or you can see its meaning or point and just say, well, I adapted it this way. Thank you. Um, another question that was asked, and I think this is a, this is a good one to, to, to get out there, it definitely plays into our part two session, but uh, for today, um, Dr. Banky, Dr. Simons, if we suspect that our child is experiencing pain um, for something she, she gives very little signs of pain, but it's something that we know in our personal experience is probably painful. It could be menstruation, it could be GI discomfort, could be um, you know that we feel a contracture in her leg. Would you recommend um, administering painkillers of any kind in the absence of expression of pain, but an experience that would be painful if it happened to you or I? I think the first the first question is is um, I would not be comfortable just administering an analgesic unless I knew where it was coming from. If I've, however, done due diligence to make sure that it, there's not a fracture, there's not a hair wrapped around a toe, there's not an active process that I need to worry about, and my child just has pain, I think that it is appropriate to think about using analgesics. 
Migraines are common. Maybe it is a migraine. And, but I think that taking a, a measured approach of both doing, having due diligence to do investigations and then saying, having a plan with your clinician about, okay, let's try Tylenol um, or ibuprofen or, or having a plan as to, you sense your child's in pain, I don't think that you should suffer. If we can't figure it out, we should come up with a plan of how we're, we're gonna treat it. No, I don't want um, my patients to be sedated with painkillers when we should be investigating what's causing their pain. But I, I think that, that this is a human thing that we need to address. Does that answer the, you think that answers the question? I think so. Okay. I think so. And if not, um, I invite a parent or any other parent to email me separately or get your question to the queue now before we wrap up. And we'll definitely take everything offline. Um, so I think in general, we have generally answered the thematic questions that have been asked in the queue. I know that there are a lot of very specific questions about drug interactions. Uh, Dr. Simons, you alluded to that in your slides. Um, pain medications, interacting with seizure medications, uh, uh, potential of interacting with kids who have been diagnosed with long QT, uh, you know, um, uh, different things. We will get to those in part two because there is definitely a whole field of experts who discuss this and think about this and might be able to provide you with more guidance. So uh, if you still have questions in any of those specific areas, please submit them in the queue now, or you can email me separately and we'll get them prepared for our part two discussion. But I hope that everyone is taking away from today's presentation um, a new appreciation for the assessment of pain, whether our children feel pain or not. We don't have a clear cut answer, but we do have tools that can help you evaluate it in your child. And really in Rett syndrome, we have some general information, but your child is an individual and you, and you need to feel respected and supported in your feelings that something is different and something needs to be addressed. And you need to have the confidence of being able to share this recording with any professional who's working with your child who might question or fall back on they're not expressing pain, therefore they're not in pain. Or, um, uh, she just has Rett syndrome. Don't let, don't let things just be dismissed. You are your child's best advocate. You have people here at, at the foundation and in our Rett centers and our research centers across the country and around the world who believe you and who have evidence to support you in, um, in advocating for your child. So take a look at these scales. Please visit the links with Holland Blurview or um, at Gillette. We'll also share these links again um, in the wrap up. See if you can use those tools to help you in your pursuit, if this is something you're experiencing with your child. Hopefully you're not. Hopefully you just tuned in today to learn about the state of research and your child as well. That's ultimately what I hope for everyone listening today. And if you are in a place where you are in crisis and you need further information, write in and, um, and we'll see if we can get you connected with somebody who can help you better troubleshoot what might be going on. Okay. All right, well, Dr. Simon, I uh, appreciate your time today. Dr. Banky, thank you so very much for taking time out of your clinic day as well to join us and be the physician voice here. Dr. Simons, good luck with your continued work. Let us know if you have any studies that need to be populated. We want to, we want to uh, participate in that haircut and <laughs> we definitely want some better answers for our kids. So thank you. Uh, this takes us to the end of our time and we really appreciate you. We look to see everyone again next month for life hacks and uh, ways to enjoy inclusive holiday experiences. All right. Thank you, everybody. This concludes our webinar for today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.